I'm Daryl Ayers, and I have the pleasure to be the Vice President for Education here at the Kennedy Center. So welcome to the Terrace Theater, to the Kennedy Center, and tonight's, to, to tonight's Millennium Stage performance. We're so delighted to have you with us. As you may know, every night, 365 days a year, we provide a free performance, the best in music, theater, and dance here at the Kennedy Center. Now, if you're not able to be with us for a particular performance, we also provide every evening's performance free on the internet at kennedy-center.org, and we also record those, those broadcasts for future watching at your leisure in our broadcast archives. Now, tonight is part of the 44th annual Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, where we're celebrating the next generation of voices of the American the theater by showcasing the national finalists of our 10-minute play festival and also the 10-minute student playwriting award. I want to do a special thank you to the Harold and Mimi Steinberg Charitable, Charitable Trust. They're an important sponsor of our playwriting awards here at the Kennedy Center. So, we're going to begin this evening's performance with a selection from the recipient of the Harold and Mimi Steinberg National Student Playwriting Award, A Second Birth by Ariel Mitchell of Brigham Young University. Thank you. But his father doesn't have to balance his own accounts. He'd get no help from Yasir. Isn't he improving? Not fast enough. Too bad. They work on the ledgers. You've been a great help to me. You've had this job for a while. Almost three years. Three years. <laughs> Stocking, cleaning, taking inventory must be tiring. Tedious, anyway. Don't tell me you enjoy it. It's a job. Am I supposed to? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to? I mean, what would you like to do? Finish these accounts. In the long run. You ever think of your future, who you want to? Baba. All right, enough. I get it. Such a good worker. Mr. Rafat will miss you. Miss me? Miss? I mean, did he fire me? No, no, he's completely pleased with your work. But then what did you... I... You're sending me to university. No. You, know, you said that wasn't an option. It isn't. Then, then tell me what's, what's going on. Things change. It's the way the world, seasons, classes, government, people. You're talking like a woman. <laughs> your mother told me to go easy. Easy? It's time for you to take your rightful place in this family, Nasima. Nasim. Uh. Hoda? Hoda enters with a colorfully wrapped package. Hoda places the gift in Nasim's lap and sits next to him. What's this for? Open it. Nasim carefully removes the wrapping paper to reveal a white clothing box. Nassim takes the floor-length skirt out of the box. Azadeh! It's yours. But it's a dress. Yes. I'm, I'm at the top of my class. You can't. My studies bring great honor to They this have, family. yes. What, what, what will people think if I just disappear? What will you tell the neighbors? That Nassim is attending university. You'd lie. You don't have a choice. Send me there. You'd be discovered. So? Well, they beat you and ruin us. Come on. Well, would they? Who are you to question the law? What law says? I will not lose my daughter because she's too proud to know her place. You wouldn't let them. 
Don't force me to make that choice. How, how is it better if I stay here? Our friends understand the practice. Just, just let me graduate. No. Why? You're my daughter. It's time for you to act like it. We need my salary. We'll manage. I won't. I won't let you do this to me. Be still and listen. I'll listen to sense. Sit down. No. What did you say? No. This is not a choice. I won't do it. Don't speak to your father like that. How can you expect me to You'll just... do your duty. Sit down and listen. But I... Now! You're too pretty. People are beginning to notice. Who? Nasima. I am Nasim. Not anymore. I can do so much more. Much more than a girl. Woman's work is important. I'm not going to be someone's slave. Is that what you think of me? Cooking, Nasima. cleaning, con confined to the house. You insolent. My life, my school, my friends are out there. This was a mistake. She needs more time to change her thinking. I can't change the way I, I think of who I am. We don't have time. Can't you ask for a few more days? We've arranged a match. A match? A marriage. As a woman? What else would you? I'm, I'm to be someone's wife. I've spoken to his father. How could you? What? Barter me away, uh, uh, sell me like cattle. Marriage is the greatest blessing for any woman. It's a good match. And you're of age. And what better way for you to make a new start, to move on? I can't marry someone I don't even know. I didn't know your mother. I, I want more. How more than you. How dare you? You made me your son. You're equal. I convinced your father to change you. Hold on. So that when you changed back, you wouldn't have the curse. The curse? Please, please. You are not cursed, Mama. Six girls. How is that a curse? I hope you never have to understand. <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? They wanted me to take another wife. Who? Doesn't matter. Nane and, and, and Pedarjan? Right? Well, then, then I should stay, then I should stay, Becca Push. It's time for you to be a wife. Sons don't make good wives. They make happy families. We are happy. Your mother and sisters have already begun the preparations. They'll teach you how to manage a household. None. Not even the father or the sovereign can lawfully contract in marriage an adult woman of sound mind without her permission. Are you an adult? Well? Uh, Baba, I... Are you? No. So I chose. What about my job? Mr. Rafat will find a replacement. He'll never be able to find a replacement. Enough, daughter! At least let me tell him. Does everyone think I'm stupid? Didn't you think I would recognize him? Her, she's a woman. We all thought he was a- Becca Push, that's the point. He's a girl. How could she do that? Well, she put on some pants and she- I'm serious. You know the tradition, it's a blessing to marry one. She lied to me. She told you she was a boy. 
How did Father, Father find her? It was you, wasn't it? How could you? Father was looking. He asked the family first. I wanted to. And you didn't think that I should know? I couldn't. Why? You know why. What was supposed to happen? What, were you going to have her wear a burqa until the wedding night? You caught me. It was all a great, horrible plan to trap you into a horrific fate. You thought I'd jump into the chance to marry my best friend? Yes. Why? Why not? You would want to marry your best friend? Yes. Even if she was a, even if she was a he? I mean, if you knew that him as a her and then found out that she was a he? What? You know what I mean. That would never happen. But if... What, what are you so afraid of? You've been offered a great blessing. You know her. Get out. I'm your brother and you'll do what I say. Get out. You're acting like a child. Every day, he let me believe that he was something he wasn't. She saved her family. I confided in him, in Nassam. Nasima. A woman. Who should be your wife. She compromised the fundamental part of, of her being. Have you seen the way she looks at you? What? She likes you. No, he doesn't. She doesn't. Tutoring, never giving up. She played football even though she hated it. Doesn't hate it. Fine, even though she wasn't any good at it. Because he was my friend. Because she loves you. No, no, he, he can't. She, she can't. Why not? This isn't how it's supposed to work. I can't look at her without seeing him. It could be worse. Yeah, right. Would you rather marry a stranger? Haven't you been listening? Well, now you'll get your chance. I want to marry a woman. She is a woman. Not to me. Baba chose her for you. Uh, no, you did. They knew who she was to you. You convinced them to take your frustrated love life out on me. This is not about me. You're of age. Why aren't you married? Baba indulged you for too long. If I was in charge, Well, you're I... not. You know, someday, a man's going to put you in your place. And you won't have anything to say otherwise. <coughs> Lila. So I suppose that's what you wanted. A woman, a doll to wait on you hand and foot. A person to exercise dominion over. Is that marriage? Is that your idea of love? No. I meant... What is it then? What do you want? Not this. Answer the question. Time. I need more time. There isn't any. You have to act now. What do you want in a wife? I don't know. There. Are you happy? I want love. I want freedom, I want equality. Someone to talk to, to share with. Someone who understands me. A true friend. What about honesty? You want honesty? Stop lying to yourself and open your eyes to see what is right in front of you. You have a chance at something that most of us will never have. How do you know that? I know her. End of scene. <laughs>Good evening. I'm Georgia McGill. I'm the chair of the National Playwriting Program for the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. And I want to thank you for coming here this evening to celebrate these young artists. As Daryl said earlier, in this incredible temple to the arts, 
365 days out of the year, there are artists here within the Kennedy Center. But in this very special week that has been carved out, we make space for what is to be the future of the theater in the United States. And it really is an extraordinary time. It is an extremely emotional time for those of us who are going to turn the theater over to these young hands that we really want to celebrate. The 10 Minute Play Festival is a national festival. And as a part of the 10 Minute Play Festival, we challenge young playwrights to create a world, create characters that we can really embrace, have them tell us their story, draw us into their story, and get in and out in 10 minutes. Not easy. So what you're going to hear tonight are plays that have traveled the country, being read and responded to and read in their home regions. And tonight, they settle here with us for a brief moment. And what you're hearing is really a very precious moment for those plays. We don't want them to stay here. We don't want them to stop here. But it really is quite a moment for these plays that have really worked so hard to get to this wondrous place. Please join me in congratulating these playwrights. Thank you. Like Pigeons by Nate Harpel. A quiet city park. Alphonsus, very old, sits on a park bench. <clears throat> Bartholomew, also old, enters. <laughs> <laughs> they watch some pigeons. <laughs> Feeling old? You know it. How could you tell? You look old. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> the groan as you sat down, the weary glance at the pigeons. Fucking pigeons. Good old pigeons. Ah, <laughs> oh, my knees, they are aching something. It's my hips what hurts. My hips still doing all right. My knees ain't so bad. Ha, growing old is a hard on the bones. You drinking your milk? I hate milk. It's the calcium, what's important? Chocolate's got calcium in it, doesn't it? It's the milk and the chocolate gives chocolate the calcium. I do like chocolate. Chocolate donut. Oh. I'd eat a chocolate donut. Uh. Got a buck or two, I do. I, I got some change. I'd go halvesies on a couple donuts. They count their change. 15 cents, 20, 30. 35, 50, 60, 60 70, 80, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, buck 05, buck, buck 10, buck 35. Plus 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 cents. 2 buck 32, if my mathematics ain't escaped me yet. At all? I'm afraid that's the truth. Well, I would have to buy a couple donuts, wouldn't it? I would have to. But would it buy the coffee? Now what's a donut without coffee? What's coffee without donuts? It's truths, you tell. <laughs> We're running out of time. We don't get much, Bart, I know. Bartholomew, now. Time to grow up, Al. Turn 90 next week. 90 years old next week. My, how the time flies, like a hummingbird. Like a sparrow. Like a carrier pigeon. Fucking pigeons. Good old pigeons. <laughs> they watch the pigeons. Look at their watches. Say, you suppose I should start going by Alphonsus? Why would you do that, Al? 
Well, I'm starting to show my age as well, ain't I? Maybe it's time. Well, maybe I suppose you should. How old are you now? 88 last February. 88? I remember 88. Good year. Last time I fell in love, I was 88. <laughs> are you sure? Dead sure. 88, like the keys on a piano. 88? Damn it. Last time I had my heart broken, too. 88. Surely you ain't having your heart broken at this age. Figure to be used to it. The heart's a muscle like anything else. Gets older and more fragile just like the rest of us. I'm a more sensitive man than I used to be, Al. <laughs> you ain't had your heart broken recently? Uh, I don't recall it, but my mind isn't what it used to be. I forget a lot of things these days I do. Ain't that the truth? You remember Clarissa? If I remember anything, still got her photo with me. Wrote her name on the back. Got it right here, right here in my billfold. Uh, here, have a look, see, would you? Oh, such a pretty girl. She was a beautiful woman. She was one foxy lady. She was all true, all true. Ain't it though? True is true. You really loved her, didn't you? True is true. Say, you seen her or you seen Clarissa lately? She left us a few years back. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Well, it sure is sad. It sure is sad. Fucking pigeons. Good old pigeons. Huh. Life sure is sad. Like your old sad songs. You still sing those old sad songs. I don't know now, Bart. Bartholomew. Would you sing me something sad, Al? Alphonsus. Alphonsus. I need to hear me something <laughs> sad. Sing me one of them old sad songs. My soul is young, though my skin is old. My bones are broken, left along the road. Someday I'm going to disappear and going to fly away. But my soul, my soul is going to stay. I'm going to stay. That's awfully nice. Maybe you want to join in with me. My soul is young, though my skin is old. My bones are broken, left along the road. Someday I'm gonna disappear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly away. But my soul, my soul is gonna stay, gonna stay. I remember that one. You wrote that one back in the day. Back in the old days, old, old days. Ah, that's a song. Like an angel whispering in your ear. Angels? When you get to be my age, you will believe in angels. Angels, I don't know. Yeah, just you wait. 88's an easy year. 89 was bad. Bad year, 89. <laughs> How's 90 looking? Exponentially worse. <laughs> Exponentially worse? Shit, we're running out of time. Oh, now it's a nice day. You know, children playing in the grass, birds merrily chirping away. I suppose it is. <laughs> I suppose it is. There's no hurry. There's no hurry. Pigeons bopping about. What are you always going on about pigeons for? You know, men like you and me, we're, we're a lot like pigeons. You think so? Yeah, wandering about, bobbing our heads, no particular place to go. Wander away, fly back home. Say, how long is it since we last saw each other? Oh, oh must be 30 years, 20, 30 years. My, my. Huh? Oh, Clarissa. 30 years. Really? Clarissa and I used to dance, close our eyes and sway together. We would dance, dance, dance. Clarissa and I used to dance too. 
to those old songs on that old Victrola. That was years oh, ago. Oh, Clarissa. Oh, Clarissa. Dancing with her across the floorboards of our home. Dancing with her across the bricks outside the door. Dancing with her love. Oh, if I may. Ah. Dancing with Clarissa across the floorboards of our home. Dancing with Clarissa across the bricks outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> Your hands are much rougher than Clarissa's. <laughs> Your breath stinks. You're far too tall. Your skin's mostly liver spots. We are running out of time. Donatello. Oh, him too. He was older than me. Must have grown into his name years ago. Fine man, fine man, that man. Shame to see him go. Ain't the truth, poor old Don. Poor old Donatello. Poor old Donatello, 99 years old and still died too young. Ain't that the truth? Sure is, sure is, sure is. Well, let's go put him in the ground. He's with Ma and Pa now. Only two of us left. Only two brothers left. They start to head off, slow. Uh, oh, my knees. Oh, my poor old hips. You know, if we split one donut and one cup of coffee, I imagine we'd have enough. We are running out of time. He can wait. Donatello's not going anywhere. No one's running away now. <clears throat> Too old to run. They pass the pigeons as they leave. Fucking pigeons. Good old pigeons. Good old pigeons. Mm -hmm. End of play. Disconnect by Katie Shea. Lights up on a hospital waiting room. Mara is staring at a form on the table in front of her. There's an untouched cup of coffee next to it. Diane enters. How is she? The same. Do they have any more results? No, they stopped running tests. Then... Why were they in there? They're just monitoring her. Well, what are they looking for? They're not looking for anything. Then why are they in they there? Just, they just, they just want to make sure she's comfortable. I, I thought she, she couldn't. They said, they said that she wasn't going no. to be able to. No, she can't. They're just making sure. Are they still in there? No, they just left. 
So she's all by herself? Her father is with her. We need to talk. I, I need some coffee. You, you can have mine, but uh, don't worry. I didn't drink any of it. Uh, I could use a walk anyway. We need to talk about this. No, I, I just need a few minutes. Please sit down. I really need some air. I'll be back soon. We can't keep ignoring what she wants. Are you... Implying I, I'm not, I'm not, that I'm not I'm implying ignoring her. anything. I'm just asking you to hear me. This isn't just your decision. Hmm. Technically, it is. Maybe you should get some air. I'm fine. Her father will be in there for a while, so you're not going to miss anything. I just want to sit. <sighs> It'll probably do you some good to get I don't need air. air. I need to talk about this, and I'm not going anywhere until we do. So we can talk about it, or we can sit here in silence. Your choice. I told them to leave her jewelry. What? Even that nose piercing. I told them to leave everything where it was. Good. I never understood her fascination with putting holes in her face. She thought it changed the shape. Made it slimmer somehow. Oh, that's ridiculous. I know. When she was a kid, I swear, she'd come home from school with some new kind of earring every week. I suppose it was my fault for sending her to public school. <laughs> the back row's practically a tattoo parlor. One time she colored her whole head bright blue with a Sharpie, and they mean it when they say permanent marker. <laughs> I had to pay over $100 to get it fixed. <laughs> I just thought you should know. I, I didn't have them touch anything. Thank you. Even her ring. Oh. We're doing what we think is best. You haven't seen her in six years. <laughs> We let you be here, but you're not entitled to make any kind of <laughs> I decision. I don't feel entitled. I feel responsible to respect what she would have wanted. How can we know what she wanted if nothing was signed? She didn't think about things like that. Healthy 28-year-old shouldn't have to think about things like that if she had thought she needed no, to. No, but she didn't. And that's what it's come down to? Facts and legality? Yes, technically, yes. Yes. Yes, but maybe you should go get some air right now. And I guess you can technically make me. Technically speaking, there's no reason that I need to be involved. No reason that I should even be here in the first place. Technically, legally, we might as well be strangers, but we both know better than that. She's your daughter, not a parking ticket. Act like you've met her. We're trying to make sense of this as much as you are. I don't think it's going to make sense. So this isn't something that you just rush into. She's in there right now. Every second we're out here trying to make sense of this, she's in there. Every time we take a walk or get some air or check our phone, she's lying there attached to machines and wires and she's disappearing and she's fading. She's dying. We have to respect what she wanted. We didn't know 
what she wanted. I know she wouldn't want to be left here to rot. Well, you can't come in here and take her. I didn't take anyone. She left when you pushed her out. Well, we couldn't stand back and support her making decisions You're a like mother. That. Support is pretty much your entire job description. No exception. I can't lose her again. I couldn't take her from you even if I wanted to. When did telling her how to think ever work out in your favor? <laughs> Never. She was always pretty stubborn. Stubborn doesn't begin to cover it. I don't hate you. Thanks. No, I, I don't. I don't. I never hated you. Sometimes I was even jealous of you. Of what? Well, you got her. You could have had her, too. No, I couldn't. It's not an either-or sort of deal. Well, I didn't know how to. How to do what? It's, it's, it's not something I grew up believing Did was okay. Did you ever ask her about it? What? If you didn't understand, did you ever just ask her? Well, that's not something you can it's just... It's part of her. Don't you think she wanted to tell you? I guess. I don't know. Things are only as different as you make them. I just never knew what to ask. I figured if she wanted to discuss it, she would. How do you explain the way your husband looks at you while you read the paper? Or the, the subconscious smile he gets when you put on a nice dress? Or the, the feeling you get whenever you hear their name, even if it's common. It doesn't matter if they're talking about their niece or roommate or, or the checkout girl at the Walgreens. I hear Sarah. And I am instantly next to her. Like a, a secret between the two of us. It wasn't animalistic or crude like it's made out to be, but something as pure and instinctual as love isn't easy to explain. I, I can't, can't stand the thought of losing her either. It's funny how you can still be afraid of something even after it happens. She was the person that I shared my life with my fellow schemer. And she was never mine. Hm. If you try to hold on to love that big, you'll lose it. She was the kind of beautiful that just passes through you. The kind of sweet that keeps you optimistic when crowds of people are protesting your relationship in the form of a chicken sandwich. The kind of unconditional that makes you stop looking for where you belong. When it comes down to it, I, I don't think your fear stems from how different we are, but from how much we're the same. She always knew you loved her. I always did. But I know she wouldn't be able to stand the thought of being hooked up to a wall like some kind of science project. You wouldn't be doing that for her. We're trying to give her every chance. Does she have a chance? Well, this has to be a family decision. I may not be your family, but she was mine. Oh, I know. I 
have to talk to her father. Of, of, of course. I'm not saying. I, I know. That I hear you. I'll, uh, I'll get you some coffee. To you by Lisa Grissom. We're in a bathroom in a small town in the suburbia of Boston. It's a bathroom that only if you know where it is can you find it. Rachel Slater. <laughs> Is that you? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't remember names I very well. I saw you in the hall and I thought I, that this was you. It's really strange. Oh my God, Rachel there Slater. There were name tags, right? They always have name tags at it's these things. It's me. It's Tammy Dylan. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm early. I, 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 uh, I just came in here to, oh, you know. That's, that's pretty. Can I see what color? Uh, sure. You look really amazing, Rachel. Really. <laughs> amazing. Uh, you too. Mm -hmm. Your hair is so dark oh. now. I mean, you used to have all that blonde. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. It just turned brown one day. <laughs> well, that, that was a, a big part of your look back then. Yeah. Yeah, the, your hair used to be so long and shiny. I mean, it's still, it's still shiny. Yeah, it's, it was a little less um, big, oh, yeah. shall we say. The big hair. Yeah. You remember, it was so, you know. <laughs> <Whoa. Yeah. laughs> I mean, mine's still pretty big, though. Oh. So. <laughs> Yours looks really great. Oh, gosh, thanks. Well, I'll, I'll see you out there. Hey, um, hang on a second. Um, I wonder who's going to be here tonight, you know. Do you remember the band? <laughs> the bands were always kind of lame, but the dances, oh, I always loved the dances. Didn't you think that? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I still live in town, you know. Uh, three generations of Donlins, not going anywhere. <laughs> Married a fighter, fighter. You, uh, you, you remember um, Quinn Sutton, Quinny, football team. Of course, 
Yeah, you wrote that whole article about him for the school paper with, oh. a, with a picture and everything. Wow, you have a really good memory. I don't, I don't really remember. I think remember. he always, you know, liked you a little. Well, I mean, we always sat near each other you know, since grade school. Slater, Sutton. <laughs> what does he look like now? He's still hot, if that's what you mean. Oh, no, I, I didn't. I, uh, no, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah, we hooked up summer after school and... That was it. <laughs> what about you? Oh, I, I got married out of grad school. Oh, yeah, some are still working on their second marriage, so maybe you had the right idea to wait, you know. Uh, you know what? You, you kind of lost your accent. Right. Sometimes <laughs> these things just yeah. fade. But it can yes. come back, though, because it's in your DNA, right? <laughs> I want to hear it. You know what? I'm going to make uh, it come back. That would be a riot. If uh, you yeah, out there, I, I don't think talk. so. I, I'm going to see if they need some help with decorations or... So wait, wait. You moved away, right? I mean, of course you did, because otherwise I would have seen you around here. Yeah. I live in Chicago. I'm married, and I'm a curator of antiquities. What does that mean? <laughs> um, so I have my master's in art history, and I work with ancient artifacts from all over the world, and I put together these large-scale exhibitions. Well, I'm sure you've seen them at the uh, Museum of Fine Art downtown. You mean Boston? Yeah, it, you must have been to the museum. It's one of the best in the world. Oh, not so much. You know, never actually. Oh, I I, uh, I stay close to home. <laughs> Town seems uh, pretty much the same. Yeah, it pretty much is. Yeah. You know, things things change here and there. People, you know. Yeah. You got kids? I got three. I've got one. He's four. Oh, I had mine right out of school. Oh, where'd you go? What do you mean? Right, of course, sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got pregnant and stayed home with the kids. The oldest is 20. Wow. And then uh, 15 and then 13. You see this? <laughs> is that a tattoo? Of the scar? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Scars fade. That tattoos are permanent, you know? <laughs> and my kids, they, they made me grow up, so I did that so I can remember that, you know? Do you have any? Well, uh, yeah, like I said, I have one. He's four. I mean tattoos. Oh, um, no, that's not exactly my thing. Everyone has scars, though. You want to touch it? No, thanks. Uh, just messing with you. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you should have seen your face, though. Yeah, I'm gonna hit in. Hey, 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 look at this picture of my kids here. Hold on. Oh, I, I can see Quinn. Yeah. yeah. They get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> like me. Not, not like you. You were a good kid. Yeah, well, we didn't know each other that well, really. One of them in particular, my girl, you know, she went through a lot with, with other girls, you know. So uh, people will be arriving soon, so I'll see So my out girl, there. she had this situation with, with these others, and it, and it made me remember it's, all this stuff, so. It's in the gym, What I'm right? trying to say is that I, I, I'm really sorry about I, I don't know what those. you're talking about. This is the bathroom. I'll see you out there, Tammy. Rachel, just listen to me for a second. Listen to me. I... Tammy, I came here to have a drink or two, match a few faces with some name tags, and see the people who meant something to me while I was here. I didn't come here to hear your confessions in the bathroom. My daughter came home from school one day, and her clothes were all torn and ripped. And I asked her what happened, and she said she fell. Only I know she didn't fall. Because those rips didn't come from a fall. I know those rips. I, I know what it takes to make them. And I said to her, I told her. Shut up, Tammy. I want you to shut your lip glossed mouth. I want you to live in whatever private hell you are living in where you teach your daughter lessons you never learned. You want to erase what happened, but you can't. It's her.
permanent. Like your tattoo. Will Quinn be here? Um, yeah. Good. I always liked him. He sat behind me in school every year. He used to play with my hair. I always liked that. Washing Up by Mildred Birch. Setting, an apartment in a large city, 2012. There are two chairs on either side of a rented hospital bed and a nightstand. On one wall is a door to the rest of the flat. On another is a window looking out over the city. Cast of characters, Ruth, 24. Rebecca, 30. Ruth's older sister, Jean, 52, in a nightgown under the covers of her bed, Ruth and Rebecca's mother. At rise, Ruth slouches in a chair asleep with her head against the hospital bed. Jean lies still in the bed, covered to her shoulders by the bed covers. Rebecca sits in a chair on the opposite side of the bed, fidgeting. She gets up and exits. Rebecca's voice is heard off stage, though her words are unclear. She returns to the doorway. How long have I been asleep? About 10 minutes. Did the nurse go? Yeah, I told her we'd be here. Where have you been? To the bathroom? Is that all? What do you mean? You know what I mean. No. Did you call the service? Listen. I told you not to call the service yet. She's not ready. I'm not ready. Ruth picks up a book and flips through the pages. I haven't done it yet, and neither have you. Calm down. I am calm. I can tell you called the service. Call them back. I'm not done. I want to do this. And I want you to do your part. 
Okay, don't. But I want my time. Why? Because I promised her. We're not even Jewish. Yes, we are, technically. Because she is. She didn't practice. Her parents didn't practice. We didn't practice. It doesn't make sense to do what you're doing. According to the book, if she's Jewish, so are we. For all our lives, we've heard her talk about her grandfather. She wants this because of him. We can do this for her. We don't know how. Our father was a Unitarian minister, for Christ's sake. Are you trying to be funny? No. And stop saying for Christ's sake. It sounds ridiculous on a Unitarian. <laughs> Okay, so I'm ridiculous, but you're not Jewish, and I'm not Jewish. They name you Rebecca and me Ruth. You can't get more Jewish than that. <laughs> Dad was being generous. His family was strictly Plymouth Rock, and he couldn't bear another relative named Constance or Prudence. I, I didn't agree to do any of this. Then don't. If you can't recite a prayer to hell with you, call the service back and, and tell them to wait. It's too late. They're on the way. Tell them to wait when they get here. Ruth prepares to go out of the room. Where are you going? Just to the kitchen. I'll come with you. You can't come. Someone has to stay here. It's, it's, it's a part of it. Look, I I'm fairly certain it's okay to leave her while we step into the next room. Come on. What do you need? A wash rag, a, a towel, a bowl, warm water, and turn up the heat. If I'm going to give her a spitz bath, I don't want it to be so cold in here. They go out together. Jean sits up. My grandfather was a rabbi and a proud, lonely man. His wife was already long dead when his only child, my mother, eloped with an ethical culturist. <laughs> Grandfather disowned her only to find that he had no one else to care for him as she did. Within the year I was born and named in his dead wife's honor, that gave him the excuse he needed to let his daughter back into his life. It was a story that did it. She sent it to him with the card announcing my birth. Once there was a rich miller who kept his daughter at home. She sat on the balcony like a bird in a cage, and young men came to admire her. The miller chased away every suitor, claiming that none was good enough for his Hannah. Finally, the young men stopped coming, and she languished a long time, sitting on that balcony, overlooking the street, all by herself. Finally, a bent, strange-looking man appeared beneath the balcony and called her name, Hannah! Hannah! And she reached out to him, and the miller tried to shoo this man away, but he returned again and again until one day, he leapt from the street to her balcony, enfolded Hannah in his cape, and flew away. The miller stood on the step of his fine house, helpless, watching his daughter disappear into the heavens, wrapped in the arms of her bridegroom, the angel of death. Ooh, goosebumps, right? My grandfather put a lot of stock in stories. Maybe he took his daughter back because he wanted to see if she'd married the angel of death. The old man eventually came to live with us. We loved the stories, the rituals of the faith that his daughter left behind. And me, he loved me. This is the least I could do for him. Jean hears her children coming and lies back down. Rebecca and Ruth return. Ruth is carrying a bowl of water, a towel, and two wash rags. It's called a mitzvah. It's a religious duty and a kindness. I, I, I don't want to see you naked. 
Think of her dignity. She, she wouldn't like it. Rebecca, even the doorman seen her naked. When the tumor spread to her brain, she went downstairs to the lobby naked more than once. Christ! Downstairs and wait for the service. No, I, I'm not going to leave my little sis. Tell me, if Jean wanted this so badly, why didn't she talk to me about it? I'm her executor and health care power of attorney. I don't know. You were out of the house and I was still here. She said you knew that she knew you were squeamish ever since you watched me getting born. So I guess it's my fault, really. <laughs> it's okay, sis. I don't have to pass the bar to give somebody a bath. You know what would help me while I'm doing it? Go over to the window and tell us what you see. I've been describing the sunset to her every day this week. I'd hate for her to miss tonight's. Rebecca moves to the window. Um, the, the sun is just set over the park. There's a streak of color on the horizon. A braid of fuchsia, violet, and gold. The lights are coming on in the building. But when they first appear, they look like fireflies flickering above the city streets. <coughs> Doesn't that sound beautiful, Jean? Remember when we used to chase fireflies in the park after the summer solstice potluck? <laughs> yeah, nothing like a Unitarian potluck. <laughs> Two pans of brownies, a box of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and some pork rinds. Definitely not kosher. Jean? It's okay. Um, I'm just going to give you a little spitz bath like you used to give me when I was homesick from school. Mom, I'm going to take off your nightgown now. I, uh, I turned up the heat so you won't be too cold. Ruth tries to work Jean's nightie up and off of her. Ooh. But Jean's weight is an unanticipated obstacle. Rebecca! Rebecca! Rebecca comes to the bed and assists Ruth. They pull the nightie over Jean's head. and lay her down again. Rebecca takes a wash rag from Ruth. It's okay, sweetie. It's okay, sis. We can do this. <coughs> Here we go, Jean. Under the arm. Doesn't that feel good? Now the other. Good girl. They work together to bathe Jean's body from head to toe. <clears throat> There's a knock at the door. Ruth exits. Rebecca picks up the book and as Ruth returns, Rebecca reads aloud. Baruch, Zion, Emet. Blessed is the one true judge. The service is here. I told them to wait unless you think it's, um, it's time to... Consulting the book, Rebecca tears the neck of her t-shirt. Ruth tears the hem of her t-shirt. No, you're right. It can wait. 
I want to read some of these psalms. Ruth exits, and Rebecca pulls the cover all the way over Jean's head. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul. He directs me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even if I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they will comfort me. You will prepare a table before my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup is full. Only goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years. End of play. <laughs>